Um, so it's not a good way to reach me directly, but uh, it is a good way to reach other users. The other thing is that there is a list. Uh, you can pull up a list of participants. You can see who else is um, who else is here today. Um, and there is also a way for you, and I think it's in the participant list, there's a way for you to raise your hand. Okay, If you don't feel comfortable interrupting, you should, first of all, you should feel comfortable interrupting me. One of the things that we have to do in this online format is get a little bit more used to being a little more aggressive about that sort of thing. So feel free to interrupt me anytime, please. I, in fact, I prefer it. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable, you can raise your hand. And since I'm going to be busy giving the talk today, Bert, you will be taking care of kind of the hosting, uh, the, the technical things behind the scenes. So hopefully he will notice if you raise your hand that you can stop me and uh, and you can ask a question or you can, you can uh, text your question via the chat. You can text your question to Bert and then Bert, can uh, can ask it also. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Bert, John Rodness is asking if there should be sound. So can you uh, uh, help him get that straightened out? Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. So one of the, one of my goals for this uh, for this second sort of time through the seminar is to try to encourage a better sense uh, of more interaction between people. And so, as I say, please interrupt with questions. I will be stopping, uh, uh, hopefully, if I remember regularly, to ask for questions, to listen questions. And what we're going to try to do at the end of the talk today is have kind of a, 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 a sort of an in, more informal question and answer session. So after the talk is over, I will stay online for as long as people want. If people are ready to leave, they're welcome to go. If they want to stay and listen to the conversation or, or talk about things, that's fine uh, as well. Okay, so um, with that, I think we are ready to start. Bert, is there anything else that I need to add? Um, I don't, I, don't, I can't think of anything. Well, one other thing is that, I mean, it helps if you have your, with Bert and me accepted, it helps if you have your, your audio muted during the talk and it cuts down on background noises. Unless you're asking a specific uh, question or saying something, it's best to have the, uh, the, the mic muted. Okay? All right. So um, let's get started. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about a project um, involving stable homotopy groups. And everything that I'm going to say is joint work with... Jolie Zhu and Ojin Wong. Okay, uh, so I'm going to be entirely working at p equals two, and everything that I'm thinking about is stable. Okay, so to begin with, let's talk about a little bit about the relationship between motivic. And classical Okay, so on this left side, I'm going to write things about the C motivic stable homotopy category. And on the right side, I'm going to write things about the usual topological stable homotopy category. There is a functor that connects these categories, okay, and uh, I don't want to talk about what that. Uh, geometrically what that functor is today, but I do want to tell you what it does sort of algebraically. And right now this doesn't make sense, but I will explain that how this functor has the effect of inverting tau on calculations. And you'll see what tau is here um, in, in a second. Okay, so in C-motivic homotopy theory, we have the cohomology of a point which is bi-graded because motivic homotopy theory is bi-graded much in the way that equivariant homotopy theory is, uh, is graded by something more complicated than Z. Same thing in motivic homotopy theory, it's bi-graded, okay? And it is, the cohomology of a point turns out to be F to a joint tau. This is a deep, hard theorem proved by Blavatsky, okay? Uh, and then over here on the classical side, of course, we have that the cohomology of a point is F2. Okay, and you can already see uh, the sense in which the thing on the right is what you get when you take the thing on the left and you invert tau. Well, that's not quite true, right? But uh, 
if you invert tau on the left, what you get up to a unit, what you get is on the right. And we're going to see that again and again, that you sort of, you're not literally getting uh, the thing on the right when you invert tau, but you're getting it up to a unit, which it ends up not mattering. Okay, so the next thing that you need is something about the motivic steroid algebra. So the C-motivic steroid algebra, or the dual steroid algebra. Well, I'll work entirely in the dual today. And so we start with the homology of a point, or the homology of a point, I guess. And then you join some tau i's, some i plus one, i greater than or equal to zero. So you get this big polynomial thing, but then you have to mod out find a relation, tau i squared is tau i plus one. And then on the right side, homology, the dual dual algebra looks like F2 adjoin a family, say, zeta i, or i greater than zero. Okay? So what happens under this comparison between homotivic and topology is that over here, you have a tau i, and it maps to zeta i, and then you have ci plus one, and it maps to zeta i squared. And if you invert tau, then these formulas agree, again, up to a unit, which ends up not really matter. Okay? That's the way in which you should think about, about the tau i's and the ci plus one. The tau i's are like the usual generators, like the square, like the square not, not, not actually. Okay? All uh, right. Dan? So, yeah? Uh, this is John Palmieri. What, what's uh, zeta zero? Um, Zeta zero or, or is the dual of square one. So it's C one in the usual. I guess that's right. Okay, let's change this. Let's change this. Let's make this greater than equal to one, and we'll make that and that. I think now it's a bit more standard. Does that, does that, does that satisfy you, John? Uh, yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so, I, uh oh, oh no, lost my cursor. Hang on a second here. Oh no, faster. All right, folks. This thing is working. But uh, I'm working for a second. Okay, I'm going to stop the share here while I fix this. Sorry. On the more geometric side of things, uh, I graded family of spheres, SPQ, and the SPQ realizes under this functor to the usual um, p dimensional sphere. Okay, and then we've got I graded homotopy groups over on the left side, and here we've got a single family, a, a singly graded family of homotopy groups, and even at this very bottom level of homotopy groups, it is still true that if you take uh, that, that the classical homotopy groups are what you get when you invert tau in the motivic homotopy groups. Okay? And so that's sort of, the, sort of one of the keys of the project is what, what we're actually doing is we're actually computing motivic homotopy groups. And then at the very end, we're inverting tau, which, which is a very easy, simple process. We're throwing out the tau torsion is another way of saying it. And then what's left, with the classical homotopy groups, okay? So, and so, so that's kind of like the, the, one of the key sort of steps uh, linking classical and homotopy. Okay, so 
Um, this is a good place to pause and ask if there are any questions about this sort of setup about how uh, how things compare between the motivity and classical case. Okay. So the next step is to go a little deeper and think about the cohomology of the theorem. Okay. So what we want to study is something I'll call XC, which is shorthand for X over the Motivic Seward uh, algebra from the cohomology point to the cohomology point. And the next other thing, right, is that this is the E2 page of The motivic and spectral feedback. Okay, and so this this is a, this is a powerful, important tool for computing homotopy groups, right? But the first thing you have to do is some algebra, right? So you first have to compute these these algebraic x groups. And so there are um, three things I want to note about this. Okay, the first of all, first of which is that this thing is machine computable, okay? And in and uh, and and in fact, we have done this in a large range, okay? Uh, just as the classical X groups have been computed by machine in a large range. So this is an entirely practical process in the sense that the that the computer gives us way more data than we sort of have have any chance of of, of processing, okay? Um, the second point is that if you want to do it by hand, you can. You can use the May spectral sequence by hand. Okay, and we've done that in a large range, but eventually that process gets exhausting. And it, in, in order to actually make forward progress in terms of computing stable homotopy groups, you really need to start relying on, kind of, on a computer to do the parts of the calculation that the computer can do. Okay, and then the third thing that I'll say here is about the relationship. Okay. So on the one hand, you have the semotivic X groups, whatever those are. And on the other hand, you have the classical ones. And I'll use that CL from time to time to indicate that I'm talking about the classical context. Okay. And then the relationship is, as I've been saying, you invert tau and get to recover the classical stuff. Okay. So this is starting to make it look a little bit like there's nothing new, but of course, but there is tau to the k torsion in the motivic x groups that's not detected, uh, that's lost when you invert tau, and, and and so and that's kind of the new phenomenon is the tau, uh, tau to the k torsion. Okay, so let's look at some charts. Uh, this one for now. Okay, so here is a motivic X chart. All the way back to the beginning where the picture might be familiar. Um, how is that in terms of size? I can zoom in a little bit if, if that's not so readable. This is good on my that's, pr that's pretty good. All right, so um, if you uh, are familiar with the cohomology of theory algebra, this picture will look mostly familiar, but there will be some things that are unfamiliar, okay? And the very first thing that you'll see that's unfamiliar is this guy here, this guy h1 to the fourth, okay? And in, uh, and in fact, and in fact, there's a red arrow on that guy, which means there's actually an infinite power of h1 multiplications on, on this element, okay? So h1 to the fourth itself is non-zero, but tau times h1 to the fourth is zero. And so that, and when you invert tau, then it, zero, but before inverting tau, it actually is non-zero, okay? So you got that. And then if you actually look, you'll see there are lots of other red arrows around here, okay? 
and you can study all these guys. Uh, and this leads into the subject of eta periodic motivic homotopy, which uh, Bert Diu and I and Michael Andrews and Haynes Miller and others um, in, in other motivic contexts have been uh, been thinking about. Okay, so most of these eta, these, these H1 sort of powers are on classes that are pretty familiar. Um, say, if you know about the cohomology of A of 2, if you know about some TMF style calculations, these are all things. There's E0, there's D0, there's, you know, products of those things, there's atoms periodicity elements, you know, PE0, uh, and, and lots of familiar stuff in, in terms of the cohomology of A of 2. But if you go out far enough, what you find is this red arrow right here on this graph, MH1. And that MH1 is not a, 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 an element that's related to TMF. It's not detected in the cohomology of A of 2. And it was really that observation out there in the, in the late 40s that kind of led us to start thinking more carefully about what was going on in the, in the periodic homotopy. But that's a, a separate story that I won't talk too much more about today. Okay. Um, I want to talk more about the the, uh, the tau torsion. So the way the colors on this chart work, uh, the the black stuff is the uh, is the stuff that survives tau localization. So the black stuff course dots correspond to classical X, okay. But then the colored dots correspond to things that are are tau torsion, such as this class H3G here, uh, which uh, ends up showing up with you know, but it's killed by tau, okay. And you can see lots of red dots. If you, you go out to the right, you'll see sort of more and more of them here. It's one here, here's some here, right, and so forth. And then in the 40 stem, what you start to see in the, in the 40 stem are blue dots, okay? And the blue dots indicate tau squared torsion, okay? And then there's a green square here, which is tau cubed torsion, and so forth. And as you go further out, you're seeing higher and higher, sort of, uh, you know, uh, tau torsion showing up. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to talk about on this chart has to do with naming conventions. Okay, so uh, many years ago, uh, Angora did some exhaustive computations of, of the cohomology of the Stewart algebra, and he gave names to many of these elements. And the names are, there are some patterns, but there are also the names are more or less arbitrary. Each time you encounter a multiplicative generator, you introduce a new letter, you know, you know, a new element. And what we have found is that, you know, we're sort of, as the calculations get deeper and deeper, we're, finding, we're sort of running out of letters. We're running out of things to call elements, okay? And so we need a somewhat more systematic naming convention, okay? And so that shows up, for example, that shows up right here with this guy that's labeled delta H2 squared, okay? So delta H2 squared, it traditionally is called R, okay? And here, Delta is our shorthand for V2 to the fourth, okay? So that element really is V2 to the fourth times H2 squared. And whenever we have an element that we know is a V2 multiple of something, then we call it that. So here's another one. This guy used to be called Q, and now we call it delta H1, H3, and, and, and so forth. And you'll find lots of examples of delta. As you move off to the right, you'll see many, many examples of elements Involve delta. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was the M family. Here you'll see some classes whose name involves the letter M. Okay? So M is our name for the operator, the massive product operator G2, comma, H not cubed, comma, blank. And again, you you uh, you see. So this MH1 has a massive product decomposition G2 comma H not cubed comma H1, and MH2 similarly, and so forth. And if you go off to the right, you'll see many many classes involving M. Okay. And this is sort of what we what we have really what, one of the things that we've really uncovered is that sort of there's something sort of systematic going on with M that needs to um, that needs sort of a better explanation than we have. Okay. Okay. So, um, so that is some sort of, you know, so I can scroll over here just to give you a sense of how sort of, you know, of how complicated it does or doesn't get. Here, if I scroll all the way out to the very end of what we sort of are handling now, so just go back to this part. Uh, this is Mark Barron. Hey, Dan. 
Yes. Oh, uh, this is Mark Behrens. Uh, can you, uh, can you uh, scroll it up just ever so slightly so we can see the stem? The stems are actually on the bottom. Let me scroll it down slightly. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, just, just so we can see that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This chart goes up to the 95 stem, and you can kind of see that there's sort of, you know, the, the calculation is getting more and more dense. There's sort of more and more dots running around, more and more things to uh, take into account. Okay. So. This is, you know, and, and this is all done by computer. We know all the stuff because the computer has calculated all the stuff for us in this range, and we just encoded it into a into a chart for our own for our own convenience. Okay. All right. So um, the next thing that you need to do once you have sort of understood semotypic X is to start uh, looking for Adams differentials. Okay. So let's talk now about how we're going to go about finding Adam's differentials. So now, okay, so here, let me just say that again. So X, there's an Adam special sequence that converges to the semotivic groups. And then we need to find Adam's differentials. Okay, but I realize maybe before we do that, maybe I, I should go back to the chart here and ask if there are um, any, any any particular questions or things that people want to look at in this algebraic X chart. Uh, Dan, John Palmieri. Hi, John. Um, is there, uh, do you have look information on the location of like tau to the k torsion, like is there no tau squared torsion below the nine line or something like that? Do you have give a theorem? Like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so John is asking, you know, <laughs> what kind of bounds do you have on where the tau torsion can occur? Okay. So I do not, um, I do not have any theorems along those lines. Okay, uh, but there's something I'm looking for. Yeah, okay. But there isn't very much tau torsion in low filtration. Uh, so I would guess, just based on our data, let me see this, yeah, I would guess that H1 to the fourth here in the four stem is the only tau torsion on the, on the four line or below. Okay? And then on the five line, you've got H3G here in the 27 stem. H3G on, on the five line, and then H1 to the fourth, H5, and so forth. So on the five line, you'll definitely have an infinite family involving tau torsion, and then more and more. Um, excuse me. It's certainly true that, um, it, and, and John pointed out, there's this tau squared torsion um, here on the line in filtration nine. That, I'm pretty sure that's the lowest. Yeah, I guess I don't see anything below nine, but I don't have any. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's one in eight. Because scroll scroll back toward the lower stems again. I thought I saw one in eight. Ah, E1Z. Yes, you're right, in the 58 stem. Yeah. So I don't know. Those are good questions, right? There are people who kind of do these sort of filtration-wise calculations that, you know, kind of, kind of work up from low filtration to determine all the elements on the three line, all the elements on the four line, all the elements on the five line, and so forth. And you could try to do that with sort of in the filtration distribution and try to figure out what, what makes sense. It's, that's a totally plausible uh, project to work on. Okay. Dan, Dan, this is Bert. I just want to mention your audio is a little choppy, so I don't know if there's anything you can do to. Okay. That. I um, will try to make sure that I'm speaking sort of right into the mic, and maybe that will that will help. <clears throat> All right. So let's go back now to uh, talk about where the Adams differentials come from. Right. And so this is where this curious gadget, the cofiber of tau, comes into play. Okay, so tau, we've used tau so far as an element of the cohomology of, of a point, but we'll also use tau for an element in, um, in homotopy. 
And they're saying, in the sense that the tau in homotopy is detected by the tau in cohomology. And, and the change in grading is there between homological and cohomological grading. That's, that's all that's going on. Okay? So the point is that tau is an element at Adams filtration zero in the very lower left hand corner of the chart. And tau, that element is surviving the Adams spectral sequence. It's detecting some element in, in homotopy. Okay, so for tau, you can then take the cofiber and get a T cell complex. Okay, uh, this is a very curious tie. All right, so the first thing that makes it curious is that if you realize it, if you apply that function that goes from chemotypic homotopy to ordinary homotopy, then S mod tau becomes a contractible spectrum. So it completely disappears. So everything about S mod tau, in some sense, is entirely exotic. It's entirely motivated. All right. So there are lots of strange properties of this S mod tau. And the one that I want to talk about today is this specific result of Bogdan Jorge, Wojin Wong. And Julie Zhu. Okay, and here's what it says. So you can, you can set up an atmospectral spectral sequence for S mod tau. It involves the cohomology of S mod tau, which is easy to describe, and it involves X groups involving the cohomology of S mod tau and the cohomology of the points. And you can set this up and do calculations and have computers do calculations, or you can you can um, this is sort of, you know, entirely reasonable thing to do, okay? And this spectral sequence turns out to be a familiar spectral sequence. This spectral sequence equals the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence that computes the cohomology of the BP star BP hop algebra. Okay, so this is a um, this is a very strange looking result, which doesn't really even look plausible at first glance. An atom spectral sequence is just sort of this topological gadget, right? And the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence is an entirely algebraic thing, right? And these two, two things don't, at first glance, have nothing to do with each other. And it turns out that there's some structure underlying this. If you look at the category of S mod tau modules, and you look at the category of BP star BP co modules, you can find a comparison between them and so forth. So there's a lot kind of going on underneath all uh, uh, of this, okay? Um, and maybe I'll actually say just a few um, ideas about the proof, right? So I just sort of said those some words, but let me write it down. So if you look at the homotopy category of S mod tau modules, what you uh, what you find is it's equivalent to a homotopy category of BP star BP co-modules, and there are you need some uh, you need some boundedness finiteness conditions in order to make this literally true. Okay, so but but let's not worry about about that. Okay, so and um, and where and, and and let me give you one sort of explanation as to uh, why this is plausible, okay? So if you want to, so if you want to compare these two categories, one thing you can start to do is compare the endomorphisms of the unit objects, right? So here, um, homotopy classes from you know, S mod tau linear homotopy classes from S mod tau to S mod tau, right? That's the unit, the endomorphism unit on the left, okay? And that is um, by, by some standard adjointness, that's the same as just the homotopy group of S mod tau, okay? And then that turns out to be the same as the cohomology of BP star, BP star, BP, 
because the, the Adams Novikov spectral sequence for F mod tau collapses. Okay? And so the homotopy groups are actually I can wonder, can kind of like to an E2 page because it collapses. That's what's happening there. And then finally, this is uh, the endomorphism of the unit object in the category on the right. Okay? And then when you look at the Adams spectral sequence for S tau, you're sort of applying some particular filtration. And when you look at the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence, you're applying some filtration. And under this course, uh, minimization between categories, the filtration is going on. Okay, so that's obviously not a proof, but that gives you some flavor for why, uh, why such a thing turns out to be true. And the kind of the key step is right, is right here, where you're observing that an Adams Novikov spectral sequence collapses. Okay, so the corollary is that the Adams spectral sequence for S mod tau is machine computable, right? Because the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence is an algebraic spectral sequence which is machine computable. And so therefore the equal Adams spectral sequence for S mod tau is as well. Okay, so um, at this point I was um, planning to pass the mic over to Wojin Wong, who was going to talk a little bit about the code that he has written to carry out these computations. Wojin, are you there? Bert, can you tell us Wojin? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't see a, Oh wait, you just moved. Uh, there we go. Okay. What's that feedback? Is that Guojin? Yeah, I'm here. So I'm going to stop my chair, Guojin, and then you can take over. First of all, we should thank Guojin for being here because it's in the middle of the night for him right now in Shanghai. Oh. Okay. That's Gordon Wong. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. So I will say something about the Computer computations of algebraic and of Novikov spiral sequence. Okay. Can you can you turn down the the volume on your computer because we're hearing some feedback. Is it okay now? Is it okay now? Oh. No. <laughs> no, we're, we're still hearing some, uh, some uh, feedback. What about this? Great. Okay. Uh, so, I will first say something about the. Uh, okay. First, I will say something about the minimal resolution. So, 
the solutions. Are you, are you writing on your screen? Because, because, Gojang, are, are you writing on your screen? We're, we're not yes? I'm not seeing anything there. Do you see it? No. Uh, 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 I see a, a white screen. Why this doesn't work? Okay, do you see what I'm writing? Yes, we can see you. See it. Okay. First, I will say, uh, okay. First, I will say something about the minimal resolutions. BP star, BP commodities. Okay, and second, I will talk about constructing the anti breaks and the novical spiral sequence. Okay. Um, now, first, we consider the hope for anti the BP star and the BP star BP. So I will denote this half integral by the symbol a and gamma. Suppose m is a gamma commodial. Our goal is this: compute x of a to m. For this goal, what we do as in the usual way is to resolve M by relative injective commodules. So we always assume M is A free, which means it's free as A module. Then we have the usual cobar complex. We go like this from M to M times the gamma, then to M times the gamma bar times the gamma, then m times the gamma bar squared the gamma. In that way, we get a resolution of the co-module m by this relative injective module, which always looks like something tensor with gamma. And then we take the primitives of that complex what we get is, if we take primitives, we get m to m times the gamma bar and to m times the gamma bar squared. And then if we compute the homology of that complex, we compute the x of m. The only problem with this cobar construction is this complex is extremely large. We know gamma is a polynomial algebra with two sets of generators. And when we tensor it up, the number of generators go exponentially. And very soon we, we get so many generators, which makes it uncomputable even by a computer. So this means we need to find the smaller complex. In fact, we will construct the most small complex possible, which is the minimal resolution. To construct the minimal resolution, we will first start with the minimal resolution of the Hopf algebra. Recall that 
from a gamma, which we call a means BP star and gamma means BP star BP. We, here we have an inversion ideal I generated by the VIs. And we know A mod I equal FP. And gamma module I is essentially a Hopf algebra, which is essentially the zero algebra. And we will denote this by P. Okay, so this is a main observation. Suppose we have a resolution of M by in relative injectives. And moreover, we assume everything is A free. Then we find if we mod R to I, that is a is a red is a resolution of P co modules. Okay, and we'll do the algorithm in the other way. First, we will compute a minimal resolution of P co-modules and then lift it to a resolution of gamma co-modules. So this is algorithm. First, construct. A minimal resolution for the Pico module and module I. That's the usual way when we compute the cohomology of single algebra by using the minimal resolution. A second, we lift. resolution to a sequence of maps of gamma co-modules. So we pick an arbitrary lift of each of the maps in the resolution of M mod, mod I because each term is co-free as a P co-module, so we can always lift the maps. The problem with this lift is that it is no longer complex, which means the squaring of the differential is only zero module I. So we need to module modify the complex. We need to modify the maps to make it a, into a complex. So this is our final step, which means modify the maps to make it into a complex, which means we want d squared equal to zero. That is done by Gaussian elimination process. Theoretically, it's very easy because we already have a matrix and all the entries are already good module I, so we need to do some elementary row transformations to make it into the form we desire. But in practice, this, this step is the most hard one because it consumes the main part of resources. So in fact, all the resources used by the other steps are negligible compared to this step. So mo most of the optimization methods are applied to that step, including deleting some unnecessary column in the matrix 
and uh, apply the parallel algorithm to the Gaussian elimination process. Okay, when we have done this, we essentially lifted the uh, minimal resolution of M mod I into a, into a resolution of M. So we call this resolution the minimal resolution. This actually the minimal one we can hope for because as we mentioned, any resolution if we module I should be also a resolution of M mod I. So in particular, the number of generators is bounded below by the number of generators for the resolution of M modulo I. Okay, this is how we construct the minimal resolution. And once we have the minimal resolution, we can compute its primitives in that way because we resolve a um, co-module by uh, co-free co-modules, so the primitives are the same as the co-generators. And when we get the complex of the primitives, we can compute a homology and get the X groups of the co-modules. And the second thing I want to talk about is the algebraic end of novical spiral sequence. So the definition is this. Suppose we have a resolution of M and some co-modules, then we know X of M equals the homology of the primitives of the resolution. So you want to compute the resolution of the primitives of the complex R. To do this, we will, in general, use some kind of Curtis algorithm. Before this, we will introduce two, some filtrations. So uh, we call do this a general term. In the complex R will, will look like this. Be recall this is the uh, a priori is a complex of BP star modules. So it would look like this V0, I0, and V1, R1, then IN, and times something else. For anything like this, we can introduce the random filtration. Which is a filtration by the sum of the i k's. Now we can also have the ball sign filtration. We use a lexicographic order. If we use the under filtration and then compute the homologies, what we get is the algebraic and the novical spiral sequence. And if we use the Boson filtration, what we get is the Boson spiral sequence computing the X groups for BP star homologies. To do this, we will in general use the Curtis algorithm. In fact, it's a modified Gaussian elimination process. The first step is to, we start with the filtration. A second, we make, we refine this filtration. 
into a maximal one. So, so something should be noted is this. First, what we start is our filtration, which is preserved by the differentials. But when we refine it into a maximal one, we don't require this to preserve we don't require the differential to preserve the filtrations. So we can always refine any filtration into a maximal one. By a maximal filtration, we mean each sub quotient are FP vector space. With this, we can introduce the notion of a Curtis table. It has entry like this. So it's a table like this, something like something like this, or some on tank item like this. Which, um, the meaning of this curtain table means, so some, some term with leading term A, leading term B kind of boundary. A, and moreover, that is a has a minimal leading term. Which means anything with leading term strict less than B can't have a boundary with leading term A. And moreover, if Anything has a boundary with lean term not equal to E, we write E with on tank like this. Okay. And we know in general we can, when you use the euro credit algorithm, we just start some, some term and then compute its boundary and check in the in the credit table already constructed, if that leading term is already tagged, if that tagged, we modify the term we start with to get, uh, to make its boundary with a lower leading term and uh, iterate with that process. In the end, we generate some credit table. What you good about a credit table is like this. A, ta a curtain table like this in the left hand, you actually encode this. Uh, this gives data for the spiral sequence. So we can interpret this curtain table as something like this. So something like B. Has a differential to A, which actually means we can modify the basis of the complex we start with, which respects the filtration we want, and then the basic element corresponding to B supports a differential to the basic element corresponding to A. In that way, we can compute the spiral sequences constructed from the filtration we start, which means you will start with the annual filtration from the resolution of some co-module, we will get the only break and the numerical spiral sequence from the data obtained from this Curtis table. Okay, I think that's what I want to talk about today. Thanks. almost out of time and there were a few more things. Um, uh, can people hear me? Yes. Yeah, we, we hear you, yeah. All right, so we're going to go back. Um, Guozhen, can you unshare your screen? Okay. 
Okay. All right. So I want to go back and and now um, give you a little bit of a taste of what happens uh, when you go ahead and compute the atoms differentials using all this computer data. Okay. So the two cell complex S mod tau comes equipped with an inclusion to the bottom cell and a projection to the top cell. Okay, and you can then use naturality of the atom spectral sequence. So we know everything that there is to know about the atom spectral sequence in the middle for S mod tau, and then we can pull back differentials and push forward differentials and so forth to obtain differentials for the sphere. Okay. Uh, and it turns out that this is a very effective process. Okay, so let me pull up a chart here. Uh, okay, so this is actually a classical atoms chart where I've thrown out all of the motivic stuff just so we can sort of focus on what maybe is sort of more essential to us. Okay, so go all the way back to the beginning. The first differentials that you see are here in the 15 and 14 and 15 stem. Okay, so these guys are examples of differentials that are detected in algebra, that are detected in S mod tau, and we immediately know them. Okay, and lots and lots, not all differentials, but lots and lots of these differentials are detected. Okay, um, this one, it turns out, here on R on delta H squared is actually not detected in S mod tau, but that's a, another story that we won't get into too much today. Um, what tends to happen is that the hardest differentials that we, that, that from, the, from the classical perspective, the differentials that were very hard and te often tends to be pretty easy. So for example, there's this red differential right here, on E1, this E3 on E1, this is Brunner's differential. This corrected a mistake of Mahowald and his co-authors uh, in the, uh, I guess the, the uh, uh, Brunner's correction maybe was in the in the in the 80s. But uh, but that that differential comes immediately out of the algebra. Okay, it's no work at all. The computer literally tells us that that differential is there. Okay, another interesting one is this guy here, this guy on capital B1. This D2 turns out to be really hard. There are various ways that classically you can try to get at atom differentials, and this capital D1 is, is hard. Um, Mahola had this differential, but uh, his, his proof was actually had a mistake. It, had a, it was based on a misunderstanding of the value of a particular total bracket. Uh, so, but again, the computer gives that differential just for free. Okay, um, another one. This D3 on capital D3 here in the 61 stem, uh, Zhu and Wang and Zhu wrote uh, dozens of page, technical pages of, uh, to establish that differential, and that allowed them to determine that pi 61 is empty and that has important geometric consequences. But that differential, again, it took dozens of pages, is in the algebra, is immediately given by the computer. Okay, this, is, this is sort of a common theme somehow that the hardest differentials actually come immediately out of, of, the, um, of the algebra. And that, that, there's not a theorem there, it's just this is an observed principle. Okay, so all these differentials that you get for free are really, really helpful. Okay, then there are some differentials that don't come immediately out of the algebra. And those you have to do whatever ad hoc argument you can come up with involving shuffling total brackets or using relations or this and that or whatever in order to find. Okay, um, so. What does all of this give you? What did we learn about stable homotopy when we did this? Okay, so I'm going to pull up now an E infinity chart, a classical E infinity chart. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Um, and the colored lines are indicating hidden extensions by two, eta, and mu. Okay, so all in this range, this is all well known. Okay, and we, re we redid this from scratch, you know, of course, but uh, because we could, but this, this is all the range that's known in the 30s. This is all known, okay? Uh, the, up, up until this sort of latest project, 61 was the limit of our knowledge, okay? And there you can see the 61 stem, there it's right in the middle of the screen, the 61 stem is empty, okay, and that's zero. 
Um, and then beyond the 61, very little was known. There were, you know, and so what we've been able to do is all of these calculations, okay? The dashed lines are things that we don't entirely know. There actually are a few differentials that we have still not worked out. But they are, they're pretty sparse. There's, there's a couple here around 70, and then there are a, a few more as you go out into the 80s. So all of this is new. All of this is new. All of this is, is new out to about 95. Okay. Um, there are lots of things to say about specific elements. Um, let's say, let's just, just as one, one example, let's look at this guy here, theta five. There's theta five. Okay. And there's lots of multiples of theta five. There's eta theta five. There's eta squared theta five. There's nu times theta five. We know that this dot is nu squared times theta five, and that's a hidden extension. We know that this guy p prime is sigma theta five. Okay. Uh, what else do we know in terms of? We know that this dot here is sigma squared theta five, which is also kappa theta five. We know here is kappa bar theta five. Okay, so we actually have a pretty good understanding of the multiples of, of theta five uh, at this point, and there are quite a few of them, and there are some interesting things. And if you go all the way out to the very end here, this guy here, this detects theta four, theta five. Okay, and maybe I'll just say one last thing before I wrap up, and that down in here, in this lower right corner, what we are starting to see are the, um, well, let's just say it this way, obstructions related to theta six, okay? Um, and I think that is maybe, and, and what that exactly means is sort of is, is our details that are still being worked out. That's the sense in which this talk is a progress report. So I think um, this is a good place to stop the sort of the formal talk for today. Um, but I will be sticking around um, for as long as people want to chat. And hopefully, uh, and, but, it, but as I say, feel free to, um, to, to head out if, if, if that's what you want to do or stick around. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to uh, unmute everyone so we can thank our speakers for today. Now I'll, I'll mute all and then uh, with, you know, anyone who, who wants to jump in can uh, unmute themselves. Hi, uh, this is Catherine speaking. So um, Julie had mentioned to me something about looking in the 96th stem for things, 94th or 96th stem for things related to theta six. Um, that he was, that you guys were able to kind of construct a cell structure similar to the theta five story. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how much more information you'll need in order to uh, deal with a theta six case. Well, okay, so I, so the question is, what else do we need to do? If we really, if we want to nail down theta six, sort of what else do we need to know? And I guess that we're, here's where we're at. So we cer certainly don't have um, anything definitive to answer. I wouldn't not, I wouldn't be keeping it to myself if, if I did. But, uh, but it, it, I guess the state is sort of like this. We've sort of, we've kind of, figured out what it is we need to figure out is kind of the way to put it. And, and let me draw attention to this one guy right here. This guy H naught cubed H four squared H six. This guy detects the total bracket theta four comma two comma theta five. Okay. And that is sort of a, an obstruction to, to creating the, the complex that that we want. It doesn't mean that it can't be done, it just means that it has to be more complicated than it would be otherwise. If that one little dot there in the 93 stem were somehow gone, right, the, the, then, then basically the problem would be over. It's that one little guy that's sort of, uh, that's messing us up for now. 
um, you know, we plan to, by no means has this, has our method been exhausted. We're at 95 because that's just how far we've gone so far. In the next few months, we'll be tackling further stems and the picture is surely going to become clearer um, as we go and it just remains to be seen what happens. I see. So if I understand correctly, you're saying that since uh, there's an obstruction here, you guys are going to have to go further before you have um, an understanding of what cell complex you'll need. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that in the, in the, at the very end, you know, in the last few stems that you're working on, you kind of, you do what you can, but you don't really have a great grasp of what's going. We don't, re I mean, beyond 90, we know some things, but we don't really sort of fully understand it. You know, earlier in the chart, you know, we really kind of, in the, in, in the 80s and so forth, we really kind of know what's going on there now. And there's still just too many kind of unanswered things because it's so close to the boundary, basically. Once we, once we move the boundary a little bit further out and this, this area in the low 90s becomes sort of well-established territory, I, I, I hope the picture will become clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Dan. Hi. Uh, press it here. Hi, Press it. Um, I was wondering if you can tell anything about the chromatic layers of, of uh, or the which chromatic layer each of these generators are with these methods. Um, like which spectra complex will detect, for yeah. example, certain elements. Um, we do know with with our method. Yeah. We also have a full understanding of the Adams Novakov spectral sequence. Right, that's what I was wondering. You no, know which dots in the Adams spectral sequence correspond to which dots in the Adams Novakov spectral sequence. Okay, so what I can tell you is the Adams Novakov filtration of these uh, variables. Okay. Okay. That, and I think that's probably the best that we, we can do in, in that sense. But you want to know which which the, which are the beta family elements? Well, we can look that up and we can find exactly which of these guys are beta family elements. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, hey, this is Mark Barron's uh, follow up question: the process. Uh, so, uh, so, so, Guo Zhen, you were you were saying uh, that you that you basically were setting up a uh, kind of curtain table on lexicographical filtration. That's kind of a a VI Bockstein situ, you know, you're sort of reading, you know, that's recording the VI Bockstein uh, spectral sequence. So I wouldn't be surprised if somehow from from that data, from that Curtis table, you could get information on the chromatic uh, families. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's right. So let's see, for example, from that kind of story, I think we know this guy, there's a guy right here, H naught to the sixth, H4, H6. So what is that? That guy, I think, is V2 to the eighth times theta four. And that's something that I that I think we see in that kind of that, that DI information that Mark that Mark is, is, is describing. But we, yeah, well, that's something anyway. Okay, no, yeah, just, just pointing that out, cool. Thank you. All right. Hey Dan, this is Dan Duggar. Hi Dan. Um, so you talked about how some of these hard differentials were coming out of the computer calculations or coming out of the algebra. Yeah. Um, I didn't really understand what you mean by that. And so it, could you either repeat the explanation or say it in different words or something? What, what, what exactly is the algebra doing there for you? Let me just write it down in a little more detail. Yeah. All right. So when I say use naturality, right, what, what happens is this. Say well, let's be very specific. Okay. Okay. So these are two elements 
in um, in the E2 page for SMOD tau. Okay, and they are connected by a differential because the computer, you know, the computer finds these two elements and the computer finds that differential. Okay, so that is something that is known for SMOD tau. Okay, and then over here for the sphere. We similarly, you've got two elements, okay? And what we know is that this map from this S00 into S mod tau takes this H4 to this H4, and it takes this guy to this guy, okay? And so from all of that is enough to deduce that there must be a differential there as well in the in, for the sphere. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, somehow. Maybe, I, maybe I'm not understanding how the computer is calculating the differentials at the S mod tau level. Okay, because those are algebraic Novikov spectral sequence differentials. Uh -huh. And that's, that's an algebraic, those are, that's, that's an algebraic problem. Yeah. That done by computer. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. What's not entirely done by computer is sort of, you know, the computer program sort of gives one name to elements in the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence. And then we want different names kind of that relate to the, the top cell and the bottom cell. And that, you have to do that by hand. Um, you have to figure out kind of, you know, which dots correspond to which, which thing. But that, that's never been a problem, uh, at least not yet. It's the sort of thing that could tend, potentially be a problem in the long run. But, but um, and, you know, and, and this dashed arrow is not completely determined, right? It's only determined up to things that map to zero in S mod tau. And so you have to worry about that. In this case, there aren't any other elements and it's not a problem. But in, in eventually you have to start worrying about the fact that you don't, it doesn't exactly give you the differential, only up to some, you know, some possible additional terms. And then you eliminate those terms and figure out what's going on. Okay, thank you.